Staying informed is harder than it's ever been before, not because of a lack of information, but rather because of too much of it. We are bombarded every single day by hundreds or thousands of articles and opinions on social media. Any newsworthy event is analyzed, editorialized, criticized, and shared from over a dozen radically different perspectives. And on top of that, corporations and governments are super spreaders of propaganda. This mess is made even more confusing thanks to the recent advents of AI and deepfakes. So today, I wanted to start a new series about the best ways to stay informed and how to spot misinformation. This channel has always had informative videos mixed in with gaming, but due to my recent disability, I've decided to scale back on the gaming and focus on some other topics. I do, however, still have bills to pay and a burning desire to create content, so I had to find something that suited my new limitations, and after a lot of trial and error, I started doing news videos on social media. The short form content was a lot more successful than I originally anticipated, which was fun at first, but rapidly became concerning when people started genuinely relying on me for important information. I felt a strong sense of personal responsibility and was immediately faced with the harsh reality that I do not have time to thoroughly research every single topic, which leads us to the first topic of the day, research versus reality. We like to think of ourselves as being perfectly logical beings, and if you were a perfectly logical being, you would thoroughly research every single statement contained in every single news article. And by research, I mean real big boy research. This would require you to literally write down a list of topics for you to research about every article that you read. Then you would need to check at least a dozen other sources on the topic, including the full original source, no matter how long or how boring, to make sure that you have the complete picture. After that, you would need to look up full court documents, scientific reports, appendices of evidence, and sometimes brush up on relevant case law or scientific topics, depending on what kind of article you're reading, both of which can sometimes take years of mastery even after learning the fundamentals in that particular area. Then you would want to do background research on all of the parties involved in order to suss out bias, and then maybe it would be time to come to a conclusion. This is by far the most logical way to analyze new information and decide whether you believe it or not. Unfortunately, nobody has time for that. And that's not a criticism of you if you don't have time for that. That's an extremely time-intensive process. For example, the January 6th report is about 762 pages long, or a little bit longer than the Bible. An average scientific research paper is about 80 pages long, with some of them going up to two to 300, and they're filled with tons of dense math, laboratory terminology, and terminology specific to that scientific field, which has different meanings in that paper than it would in a lay sense. So if we all acted as perfectly logical beings, like we wish we were, then nobody would be able to get anything done. And I'm not saying that doing those things is bad. I'm not saying that doing research and reading full court documents is a bad habit. A rather fact, I think it's a great habit when you have time for it, but most people don't have time. So you have to really pick and choose and be careful about what you invest your energy in. And the reality is that nobody has time to do this for everything. At some point, we all have to use mental shortcuts. Enter heuristics. Heuristics are mental shortcuts for solving problems in a quick, efficient way that delivers a result that is sufficient enough to be useful given the time constraints. We all use heuristics every single day whether we think about it or not. For example, when you buy items at a grocery store, you tend to gravitate toward brands that you've had good experiences with in the past. That's a heuristic. Or when deciding how much to buy, most of the time you know that you get a slight discount for buying in bulk, so the larger packages should cost slightly less per item than the smaller ones. That's a heuristic. And a simple one, we don't eat food if we don't know what it is, because that could lead to very bad experiences. And sometimes we buy things like sweets just to make ourselves happy because that is an emotional heuristic. We subconsciously build these all the time based on our emotions. We can have anchoring heuristics by relying on the first bit of information we hear. That's usually a very important one. There are also heuristics on availability of information or representativeness, such as your past experience. And all of these things can be good and do help us save time. However, we can also develop bad heuristic habits, such as judging people based on their background or how they're dressed, which is otherwise known as stereotyping. However, I do have a warning for you. Even the best of good heuristics, the best practices that you can have here, are technically logical fallacies. 
even the absolute most efficient heuristic you can think of is still just a logical shortcut designed to save you time. You rely on these tools to get the right information most of the time, but you're not doing thorough enough research to make sure that it's right every single time. As an easily recognizable example from media, which is what this series is going to be about, uh, let's say we're talking about Alex Jones. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. And I think most of you would agree that it's accurate to say that Alex Jones is inaccurate most of the time. Most of what he puts on the show is total nonsense, conspiracy, made up, poor reporting, whatever. However, it's a logical fallacy to say that Alex Jones is always wrong, because that's not true. Sometimes he does get things right, and sometimes he is the first to a story simply because of the volume of reporting that he does. He literally has to be right sometimes, and he has to be first sometimes. Whatever you're saying, Atrazine is basically in all of our tap water. It's in everything. We're just inundated in it. So, so, you so the chemical that Alex Jones was referring to is called atrazine. It's used mostly on cornfields to eradicate broadleaves. A wide range of studies have identified atrazine as a possible human carcinogen and an endocrine disruptor. So a purely logical person from a purely logical perspective would be analyzing thoroughly every single claim that Alex Jones makes on his show, eliminating the nonsense and believing the handful of accurate reporting. The same is true in the exact opposite direction for something like, say, the Associated Press. I think most of you would agree that the Associated Press is a good and accurate reporting source that is true most of the time. However, to be purely logical, you would have to analyze every single thing that they post and work really hard to find the ones that are incorrect and kick those out of your belief system. But as we discussed earlier, doing either of these, figuring out when Alex Jones is right or when the Associated Press is wrong, is probably a waste of everybody's time. It would be more than a full-time job to do that. A lot of what we've gone over today were basic definitions and examples of logic that you would find in a Journalism 101 class that are necessary before we have more nuanced discussion in future episodes. But I didn't want to just give you meat and no potatoes. So today, I'm also going to show you a couple of things that help me find reliable sources of media. And the number one for me is this interactive media bias chart made by the nonprofit group Adfontes Media. If you get on Google and type in media bias chart, this is usually in the top 10 results. And there's a lot of charts like this on the internet. I like this one the best because again, it's interactive. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn a lot of this stuff off. And the way this chart works pretty simple. The horizontal axis is your degree of bias that the news organization is known to have, with left being left wing and right being right wing. That's pretty straightforward. And then the vertical up down axis, the higher you go, the more reliable and more accurate the news is. And what I like about this one is I can actually zoom in here and check things out and we can click things like the BBC and it'll pull up a whole overview page of the BBC explaining the rating, explaining its accuracy, and some examples of where things went very right or very wrong. And they don't have that for everything, but they have that for a lot of stuff. So generally speaking, you can see this kind of makes a U shape, which isn't surprising that the most accurate reporting tends to be the least biased, and that clusters right here in this middle quadrant which I'm gonna zoom in on is uh, mostly these guys, a lot of the big corporate news, but you'll also see uh, NPR, BNO, ProPublica, you'll see CNBC, Air Force Times ranks really highly on here too. But then as you move over into bias town, things start getting less accurate. Palmer Report, Wonkat, The Ray Zone, Socialist Alternative, yeah, are we really surprised that's not super accurate? And on these fringes down here, you end up kind of like in the abyssal zone. If I turn them back on, you'll see they put Alex Jones down at the very, very, very bottom. He has his own little page of explanations as well. So it's roughly U-shaped. My personal opinion is that you want to stick in this top four quadrants up here that I zoom in on. This is where the good stuff is. We've got NPR, ABC, we got AFP, Newsday, uh, The Hill, Reuters, all this, uh, the journal up here. Uh, these are really reliable sources that tend not to have that much bias, but as you can see, they're not perfectly centered. The sections just below it, this tends to be more the opinion section where you get a little bit of biased analysis, a little bit of personality put in here. Uh, you can kind of see roughly both sides. And then once you're down here, this is the abyssal zone. 
this is the crazy zone. This is where all the wild and wacky podcasts are, where people just make stuff up with no consequences. Pretty much anything below this second line, I would not touch if my life depended on it. And finally, just a few personal tips. Again, we're going to expand on these very, very significantly in future episodes, but these are the tips that I use for myself when quickly evaluating media. Number one is that the more personality-centered a news organization is, the less accurate that it will be. This typically comes in the form of podcasts and TV show hosts and things like that, where the show and the news is centered around their personality. It doesn't really matter what ideology they're a part of, the more personality is in the show, the less likely it is to be accurate. Number two is that the more dry and boring presentations tend to be more accurate because they have removed emotion from the descriptive language. And again, written is better. Uh, news videos, even stuff like this, and you know, Phil DeFranco and stuff like that on YouTube have emotion. They have descriptive language. They have little jokes and stuff in there. But the really boring stuff that you find on NPR and Associated Press and Reuters and all that stuff tends to be much more accurate. Number three, and this is an extremely important one for when you're evaluating a source for bias, is that almost nobody will speak out against that which pays their bills. In some instances on social media platforms, you're constrained where you can't. You'll be literally banned. But most news organizations, if they're corporations, they'll be beholden to advertisers and shareholders. If it's a YouTube channel or a podcast, they're going to be, again, uh, their sponsors or the audience. And in some cases, some shows are directly supported through Patreon and stuff like that. And that's appeal to audience. So if something goes wrong, remember that almost nobody will bite the hand that feeds them. Number four, and this one should be pretty straightforward, is the faster a story is reported, the less accurate it is likely to be. We saw this happen in real time when the hospital in Gaza was bombed. There was no disagreement that a hospital in Gaza was bombed, but immediately news organizations were jumping to be the first to say Israel did it, Hamas did it, some other group did it, the aliens did it, I don't know. But all of a sudden, everybody on my timeline and all my feeds, they were all experts on homemade rockets and JDAM missiles and they're analyzing grainy footage, trying to be the first to really bust this case and get it out there. And of course, it took like three or four days to figure out actually what went on with a really complicated analysis and there's still disagreements there. So big complicated stories to get reported quickly are rarely accurate. And then finally, the closer to the original source, the better, usually, not always, but usually you get that local news article, you get the original source, you get the original video, the original interview, you're, or especially in the case of court documents or scientific papers, the original source always contains the best information because everybody all the way down the chain is going to report off of the original source and then the first report and the second and they build and it's like playing password. It gets different as it goes. This, however, is a little bit of a logical fallacy. It's not always true. Some original sources have bias and they're not exactly super honest, and sometimes they omit things when they should not. But generally speaking, original sources are good. Well guys, that's all for the first episode of this series. I feel like I talked more in generality than I did in specifics, but uh, next episode is gonna be a lot more specific, I promise. And I hope that you enjoy uh, my <laughs> ramblings and attempt at uh, media education. I feel like I'm teaching a journalism 101 class here. But anyway, if you enjoyed, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.